fantastic. Thanks very much for that. Everybody can see that. It is being shared. Yeah, we can see it, Dave. Oh. So thank you very much for the invite. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I do work for the University of Salford. I'm a lecturer in social policy. Uh, if you do follow uh, people on Twitter, um, I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter and I keep deleting myself, but I'm now at co something called That Sociologist. Uh, there's a QR code there for lots of other stuff that I do, like blogs and stuff, if everybody wants to, to follow the work that I'm up to and YouTube videos that I'm interested in. So I'm going to talk about the role of um, food insecurity, food poverty, and why I think we are definitely in a broken food system. So, you know, a lot of this is based around stuff that Dan's just been talking about. I've, I've known Dan for, for, well, actually, I've, I've known Dan since <clears throat> uh, for about 10 years now, because this is, I'm celebrating this as my birthday. Uh, my birthday of knowing Dan, which unfortunately for me is a really sad occasion um, because it's not really my birthday. It's it's just been 10 years since I've been researching food insecurity, which I think is a real indictment of where we are in terms of, you know, food sovereignty, food ability, food communities, uh, the way that we think and feel about what food is. So 2023 does mark 10 years of me researching food insecurity which is I, I find really quite a saddening uh, point so this is kind of where my work on food insecurity started so I completed my undergraduate postgraduate and PhD research on food uh, in in lots of different shapes and sizes but food in its entirety at Bangor University in North Wales so a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about at the minute in terms of policy is based around the rise of food banks across Wales. So just to paint the picture. So this is the, the data collection that I conducted started um, with looking at when was the, the when was Wales's first food bank and it was uh, here in, in Newport and it opened in 1998. So what I was interested in looking at was the rise of food banks and comparing independent food banks with the Trussell Trust food banks. Because <clears throat> as, as you may know, the Trussell Trust is the UK's largest food bank, single largest food bank provider. <clears throat> but at the time, I was volunteering in a food bank in 2012, 2013 in, in Bangor. And it was an independent food bank. And there was lots of news about food banks. Um, <clears throat> because they just reached that figure where they fed around about a million people. And it was quite groundbreaking, this news. And I thought, well, I'm in an independent food bank here. And nobody's asked me for the data that I was responsible for collecting. And I'm a geographer, a uh, social policy, sociology geographer. So I'm always interested in mapping things. So I thought, well, if I'm volunteering in an independent food bank, then there must be more independent food banks out there. So as part of my research work, I thought, well, I know I'll map them. Um, and I, the first place I started was with the Trussell Trust because they've got a fantastic map about the location of where all their food banks are. But I thought, well, I'm going to you know, bring something new to this. And I want to look at where all the independent food banks are in relation to the Trussell Trust food banks. But also, as a social policy academic, I want to put a political dimension to this and find out when and where, uh, more particularly when they opened. So this is what the food bank landscape looked like under what I'm loosely terming here as the Labour government. I know that, that Wales has got a devolved government, but if you think about social security, is isn't, isn't a devolved policy. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this through the lens of a non-devolved social security system. So the impact uh, of poverty caused by social security, caused by the inefficiency of the social security system. So I mapped the food banks across Wales. and Underneath the Labour government, there were 16 food banks spread across Wales. Obviously, most of them are in the South Wales, Heads of the Valleys region. You know, where we've got deep levels of poverty, for example, in Merthyr Tydfil, but also at the top there where you can see the, the this this one here, this, this red dot, which indicates an independent food bank. Uh, this is Rill. And as we know uh, from, from later on, um, Rill has actually got more food banks than supermarkets now. Uh, and we know also that, for example, there's more food banks across the UK than there are 
at uh, McDonald's outlet. So as my data collection continued, I wanted to look at uh, how food banks have spread. So as we can see from this uh, part of the slide here, food bank numbers across Wales, uh, they bloomed. So 2015, yeah, so 2010, sorry, the end of the data collection here in 2010, uh, through to 2015 marks the coalition government and David Cameron's uh, government as well. And food bank numbers rocketed from a low number of 16 under the Labour government to a high of 159 during the five years of the coalition and conservative government <clears throat> across Wales. Now, the high point when most food banks opened was in 2012. And what the data shows is that this was a reflection of the impact of the Welfare Reform Act 2012. So the Welfare Reform Act brought in things such as you know, the bedroom tax, uh, more benefit sanctions, uh, and it, it just generally made people's lives uh, a lot more difficult. And what it did is it, it effectively tripped people up into poverty, into food poverty. So what is food poverty or what we also might term food insecurity? I, I, I sometimes tend to use both of these phrases interchangeably. Uh, so forgive me if I do throughout this talk, but food insecurity, food poverty, well, it's the inability to be able to feed yourself and um, also your family, but also the fear that you may not be able to do this in the immediate future as well. So it is, it has got a present tense and it has also got a future, uh, worrying a future potential problem for people. So the work of people like, uh, you know, when Dan, Dan's colleague, uh, Liz Dowler, talks about food insecurity in terms of things such as income. So you could experience food insecurity, for example, because of a lack of income. But it is also about people's access and people's ability to be able to get hold of enough food. Now, we can think of access to food in terms of things such as depending on where you live. So, for example, you may live in a, in a rural area and it may be very difficult to access you know, a bus to the local supermarket uh, if you don't drive. But you also may live in an urban area and your access to food may also be hindered because your your local high street, which is, you know, maybe very close to you, so physical geographical access to that food is, is not a problem. But the type of food that they sell may be a problem. So, for example, it may be food which is, you know, high salt, high fat, high sugar. So your access to good nutritious and healthy food is also an indicator of potential food insecurity. And we can also look at it through the lens of social exclusion as well. Now, well, the, some academics take this one way, and the way that I tend to explain social exclusion <clears throat> is, for example, if you are uh, celiac and you need you know, a certain type of food for your diet, if you're Muslim, you need halal food, or Jewish, you need kosher food. If you cannot access food, in a socially acceptable way, which is socially acceptable within your culture or within your diet. So food poverty for me tends to fall under these three brackets. <clears throat> now, when I tend to talk about food poverty, the, you know, the go-to area that I usually talk about is food banks. It is the part of the food poverty system that I do know the most about. But food poverty or food insecurity has multiple dimensions and multiple layers. So people start to recognize when income is starting to become a problem or there's something that's causing an issue in your ability to access enough food. People tend to deploy what I have come to call poverty, food poverty management strategies, which is people's ability to think and feel and then act um, in what they may feel to be the most appropriate way in order to navigate around issues in food poverty. Um, and I, I'm someone with lived experience of, of this. Um, I recognize these uh, different traits that I'm going to talk you through now. But from my research, these identities were also starting to surface with the people I spoke to in food banks across Wales. So the, I'm speaking to people in food banks across Wales and I'm saying, why are you here? And they told me the story about why they're there, but they also told me about the stories of what they did before they got there 
because food bank use is ultimately the, the last point uh, of people's food poverty trajectory. So people deploy these poverty management strategies. First thing that people tend to do when they're experiencing or about to experience food poverty through maybe a restricted budget is they start to change the shopping habits. So this is what I call where they shop down the shelves. So instead of going for the Heinz beans, they may go for the little beans or the Aldi beans or Asda beans. They start to shop down the shelves and changing brands. But they will also go to uh, the supermarket more often as well. So they'll, they'll visit the supermarket and they'll buy smaller portions or smaller shops using the small trolley or the basket. But they'll sometimes, but they often go quite often as well. So I'll just go for what I need today. Tomorrow, we'll have a little bit more money and then we'll go again for something else tomorrow. So they start to shop little and often. They also start to visit family. So this is where we see people going out and, you know, visiting mom or visiting, you know, granny or come on kids this week, we'll go and, you know, spend time with you, with your nan. And what they're doing there is that they're using family as a way to be able to, to give themselves a little financial buffer around their food. But we know that food poverty is also sometimes hidden within the family as well. And the people who tend to hide it are the parents. Now, this is a little bit different than what happened right at the beginning of the century when people like Benjamin Seabon Roundtree were examining levels of poverty in York. So, for example, in, in his discussions with people in York, it was the father who would receive the lion's share of the food because he needed to go out and earn the income. And then it was, you know, the next oldest son who would get the next largest portion of food because he may have also been working as well. But what we see now in food poverty studies is that role has been reversed and parents protect the children. It doesn't matter if they're male or female, parents protect the children and parents instinctively want to protect their children from experiencing and understanding and even realising that they are in food poverty. So the parents will restrict their diets. And then finally, the last stage in anybody's food poverty journey is that they will resort to dramatic, uh, dramatic measures such as the bins at the back of Morrison's and eventually end up at a food bank. So this food bank process in my interviews with people was the final stage of people's what, what we call a food poverty trajectory. But why does this happen? So we do live in one of the most, you know, economically, financially wealthy nations in the world. Uh, you know, we are possibly the sixth, the richest economy in the world. Uh, so why does food poverty happen in, in such a, a wealthy country? It's because, because we're embedded with insecurity and inequality. We've got some fantastically wealthy people which artificially pull up uh, the, the average wage, um, which is, you know, we actually measure the, the average wage, meet 6% of the median income. Uh, but if you removed all those millionaires and billionaires from the country, the UK would probably be around about the 29th richest country in the world. So food poverty for people happens through what we call this elastic part of the budget. So let's just assume for a, for a minute and I know that this may not be always true because of things such as zero hours contracts. But let's assume for a minute that people have got a fixed income. We know how, you know, you may know how much you're going to be earning for that month or that week. OK, so let's ignore zero hours contracts. You know how much you're earning for that week. So you've got a fixed income. You know what's coming in. You also know within reason what's coming out. So people know that they've got X amount for the rent. You know, they've got the budget minus X amount for the rent, minus X amount for the gas, minus X amount for the electricity, minus X amount for whatever else it is, mobile phone. The food element of it is what we call this elastic part of the budget. This is because it can grow and shrink depending on, on what's left. And the important part about why this becomes, why the food element becomes the elastic part is nobody will take you to court if you don't buy any food that week. However, they will take you to court if you don't pay your gas bill or your rent. So there, there is a problem with not doing that. And there's a financial penalty for not doing so. But there's very rarely a financial penalty for not feeding yourself. So people allow this as their means uh, alone. 
So what the Food Foundation, uh, the, the recent data from the Food Foundation finds out that this is for actually affects around about 9.7 million people. Uh, they have an in insufficient access to food. Now, that doesn't mean that we've got 9.7 million people using food banks, because as, as we know from the work from people like Rachel Loopstra, for example, that food bank use is a really poor indicator of food insecurity. Because as I've just described on the previous slide, people who are experiencing food insecurity have many other layers before they eventually end up in a food bank. So we, we, we can guess or recommend from the data, uh, sorry, pull out from the data that there's about one in four parents inevitably end up skipping a meal at some point during a week in order to make sure that their kids have been fed. There is a gender dimension to this as well, uh, and it typically falls on, on mothers who become the ones who skip the meal in order to make sure that their children are fed. So my research has been based around food insecurity and food bank use, more, more, predict, more particularly food bank use for the last 10 years. I, I do also look at other elements of the food insecurity system, but it's food bank use which is interesting. Uh, and I've, I've just recently come out of a meeting with uh, some food bank colleagues from the Global Solidarity Alliance, uh, which I'm involved with, uh, with, with Jan Poppendick here, who in 1998, when she was looking at the emergence of the American, uh, the, the United States uh, it, problem with food banks, because as we know, they're endemic in the US. She writes that once you let the food bank genie out of the bottle, it's impossible to put back in. Once it's out, it's out, and food banks become established. Now, we know that this is true because, you know, for example, the world's first food bank opened in Phoenix, Arizona in, in uh, 1969, um, and it's still open today. So once food banks become established, they very, 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 very rarely close. Uh, from the, the maps that I've just shown you, I actually found one food bank across all of Wales which closed, and it was in a town just on, on Anglesey, in a little town called Amloch. Uh, and it was an independent food bank and it closed and it actually closed for about six months. But then it reopened as a Trussell Trust food bank a few months, uh, six months later. So, yes, food banks may close, but they tend to reopen again. So once you've let the food bank genie out of the bottle, it's impossible to get it back in. So this chart here shows the rise of food bank use in the UK between 2008 and 2022. So looking at the same data period that I've been collecting data for, what we see is an astronomical rise in the numbers of people starting to really, really struggle with uh, what I would call possibly endemic levels of food poverty in some communities. The latest data shows that uh, almost 3 million people have used a Trussell Trust food bank. Now, what's important for me about this data <clears throat> and the data that I showed you on the previous maps is when we split the distribution of food banks across Wales, but also across the rest of the UK, and I've been working with a colleague of mine, Sabine Goodwin, from the Independent Food Aid Network, to look at the differences between uh, Trussell Trust food banks and independent food banks. When we split that data, the Trussell Trust food banks tend to number approximately uh, two thirds of the whole system with one third being left uh, to the independent sector as well. So if we can see that we've got three million people here across the, the UK using food banks, and this is just the Trussell Trust data. So this is an underrepresentation of how many people are actually using food banks because there is this, this chart here does not take into consideration the numbers of people using independent food banks as well. And this is why we know that food bank use um, is a poor indicator of the levels of food insecurity, because this is the data that tends to be used by the media, um, by politicians. They tend to draw on the trust or trust data. They tend to forget about the independent uh, food bank use. But not only that, they also tend to forget about the people who've tried multiple different strategies before eventually going into a food bank. So we know that this, this chart is a far underrepresentation of the amounts of people experiencing food poverty. So where we are in the UK, as I said, I've been researching food banks now for 10 years. Jan Poppendy has argued that once the food bank genie is out of the bottle, it's very difficult to get put back in. 
And here I'm going to pull on the work of a colleague of mine from the Global Solidarity Alliance as well, Graham Riches, who identifies that the UK is approaching um, institutionalization of its food banks. And what he means by this is that the government have started to accept that these are ex an acceptable replacement for parts of the social security system. And Riches argues that this becomes a three stage process for this for food banks to become accepted. First of all, there must be the emergence of this national provider. Now, as I mentioned, the Trussell Trust is the UK's national provider of food banks. They go all the way from London to John O'Groats. Uh, they are in every town, in every community. Another colleague of mine, friend of mine, Hannah Lambert Mumford, in 2013, wrote an article about uh, the spread of the Trussell Trust food banks, questioning the idea that every town should have one, which was the title of a journal article. But there's also another organisation to talk about, which is uh, a, an organisation called Fair Share. Now, Fair Share is a re food redistribution charity, which is set up to collect food which isn't being sold through supermarkets and then to distribute it through to food banks and for them food banks to give it out. And what we're starting to see here from work of another one of my, my colleagues in, in the Global Solidarity Alliance is this, uh, this argument of uh, the corporatization of food banks, the idea that we're, we're emerging this poverty industry around food poverty. And that's what I really want to talk about today. So Richie's third, second point, sorry, <clears throat> is that he recognizes that there must be a partnership between these emergency food aid providers and the, the, uh, the government or supermarkets or some other company. So they start to develop these partnerships where food gets collected, redistributed, shared, consumed. So we start to see the emergence of these uh, partnerships. And then this partnership develops into a relationship between the national food bank provider, whether we want to consider this as the Trust of Trust or whether we want to consider this as potentially being fair share, start to see this collaboration between the food bank and the government. Starts becoming involved in policy making decisions and policy making discussions. Now, that was Graham Rich's uh, approach to recognizing institutionalization. And for my research work, I, I took his ideas slightly further, recognizing that that's true, but also recognizing that I think we need to, to recognize the two further steps and before we can get to true institutionalization of food banks. And I recognize that food banks need to become accepted. In order for them to be completely institutionalized as part of our welfare provision, that they need to become an accepted route for people uh, when they're experiencing poverty. And we see this from an argument that was in The Guardian, uh, when food bank baskets were removed from ASDA, from the stores, and, and the community was up in arms saying, no, we need them back. They're there to help people. So what all this is, this is about this non-solving of problems. And this is where I really want to focus my discussion tonight. Uh, and this comes from the work of Wolfgang Sable, this idea that policy mechanisms are not suitable for the charitable sector, which food banks inevitably are part of. So one of David Cameron's policies was this idea of the big society. This was so we could remove through neoliberalism lots of things that were part of the welfare system and then push them over to the third sector and say, you're better off at solving that. So we see the rise of, of food charity as being emblematic of, for example, parts of the big society. But Wolfgang Sable argues around this idea that this is this shunting yard of policies where the government's not been able to solve a policy. So it shunts it over to the third sector to solve it. And unfortunately, the third sector is not equipped to solve it. So it shunt, tries to shunt it back to the government. But in trying to shunt it back to the government, the government is not interested at this point. And Ronson and Carraher relate this to uh, the food banking model to say that the government's failed in, able to, in its ability to be able to for, provide enough financial security for people so that they can buy enough food So it, through neoliberalism and wanting to cut people's benefits. So it shunts it over to the third sector. And then we see the rise of food banks who want to fill in this gap but they then feel that actually they're struggling to be able to do everything that they need to do, as we've seen the numbers of food bank users rising. So they want to try and shunt it back to the government. But in trying to shunt it back to the government, the government's not asked anymore. They just say that it's not our responsibility. You've taken over this. So the government effectively offloads its responsibility to feed people over to a charitable sector. So they end up forcing their hand to provide. Now, what this means is that the food bank sector cannot stop providing 
which is why Jan Popendix regards this as this idea that once the food bank gene is out of the bottle, you can't get it back in. It's there and it will stay there. So this, for me, is part of this poverty industry. And I want to start to look at the idea of, of poverty as being a disease. And, and for this, I'm going to draw on the work of Eldar Shafir, who argues that people struggling with poverty inevitably have a cognitive tax on their ability to think and act in what other people may regard as being rational ways. And he calls this this mental bandwidth or this poverty mindset. And he says that people are affected by this because they've got multiple layers of poverty which affect their lives. For example, they are experiencing food poverty. They are probably also time poor. They're probably struggling to buy their kids uniforms. They may also be struggling to buy themselves proper hygiene uh, things as well. So they've got these multiple layers of poverty. And we can start to see poverty then through these silos. So we see the rise of food banks to tackle food poverty, hygiene banks to tackle hygiene poverty, and uniform banks to tackle uniform poverty, for example. However, I think that, although I do, do take this idea, but I also think that poverty, I don't think it is that multiple, multidimensional. I think these are all symptoms of the disease of poverty and that it's poverty that we should be focusing on eradicating. And doing this, looking at it in these intersectional areas, we end up developing this poverty industry. Um, and linking this to the work of, um, of, of Wolfgang Sable, these people, these actors within this poverty industry, it actually becomes their job to not solve poverty. So we see people within this poverty industry easily moving between different organisations. And there's been one recent move from um, from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, you know, this, this individual has moved over to the Trussell Trust. There's been somebody from the Trussell Trust who's recently moved over to the Citizens Advisor Bureau. And it's this churning of individuals in this industry whose job it is to solve poverty, but they actually don't want to solve poverty because it's their job not to solve poverty. So I think that there must be a different way. And it's here where I'm going to introduce the idea of a universal basic income. For me, Maybe I'm a little bit utopian about it, but I think universal basic income does solve poverty. This is the answer to this churning of individuals across different poverty industries. So a universal basic income is it's universal. It's unconditional. It doesn't have any means testing, which the current system does, because this means testing leads to the maintenance of this poverty industry. So if one should stop means testing, it's universal. It's for everybody parts of the poverty industry will start to close. Once we implement a universal basic income, I think that every single food bank will close. So if we are intending on stopping food poverty, this for me is the answer. So it is for everybody and it's for always. There's no means testing, there's no conditionality, there's no behavioralism be built into it. You receive this portion of money every month for the rest of your life. Now, it isn't a panacea. It isn't everything. It's not going to stop people working because it's basic. It is just enough to cover your basic needs. So whether we want to look at this through things such as food, shelter, water, it's enough to cover what you need to be a functioning individual, to relieve this idea of this cognitive tax on people. It gives people enough so they can take a breather and think, I've got enough to survive. I can buy food. And it's done through financial means. So it is a financial reward for being part of this society. So it's paid individually to people. It can also be known by other names, such as a uh, citizen's income, a citizen's dividend, for example. So as Simon mentioned, I'm co-chair of two organizations, two labs. So we are, we are part of the UBI lab. We do look at UBI as a laboratory, something that we are experimenting with, something that we are looking at and examining. So I am the co-chair of the UBI Lab Manchester. Uh, we've got 40 plus UBI labs spread across, uh, across the world. Most of them are based in the UK and most of them are geographical, but we also have some non-geographical labs as well, such as UBI Lab Women, UBI Lab Youth, and the second lab that I'm involved in as well, the UBI Lab Food. And what this does is the, the, the UBI Lab Food is used as a mechanism to investigate where and how a universal basic income could fracture this food system that we've currently got, which rewards some people 
but punishes the majority of people. So we're looking at how a universal basic income could fracture this poor food system that we've got. Um, I mean, we, we are actively looking for members. So for those of you here who are interested in food, uh, please feel free to contact me on, on any of the details on the first slide as well. And, and uh, we could talk about how your involvement in the UBI Lab network or the UBI Lab food could be great. Thank you very much.